Several months ago, I want to say December, I was working a closed shift, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., and my delivery sector was mostly the outskirts of town, along the foothills and further north. Being December in Canada, there was about six inches of fresh snow, and only the highways and artery roads were plowed properly. Driving the rest of the roads would be a death wish if you didn't have the proper gear and experience. Lucky for me, I have an all-wheel drive car, studded tires, and chains in case things go really south, and I am one of the more senior drivers. Being one of the few people with an all-wheel drive car, I was requested to take another delivery right to the edge of our delivery range, roughly 45 kilometers from the store. Since the weather was so shitty, I called the number on my slip to confirm an address and that they still wanted the pizza. Getting the okay from what seemed like a cheery old lady, I set out down the highway. Just after I left the city limits, I noticed something alarming. All of the lights, including the street lights, were out. Assuming a power outage due to the storm, I gave my boss a call on his cell phone to confirm it. Confirming that it is indeed a sector-wide power outage, I attempt to give the lady I'm delivering to a call, trying to milk the apathy factor for an extra tip. I try and be as nice as possible. Hello, this is your delivery driver. I'm noticing that there is a power outage and was wondering if you still wanted the pizza despite these terrible conditions. The old lady responded back, goodness dear, I didn't think you would still deliver it. What excellent service from you. If you could make it out here, I will definitely make it worth your while. I've got a backup generator lighting my house, so I shouldn't be hard to miss. Please take your time due to these horrible conditions. Knowing that I had hooked a substantial tip, I put my blinker on and continued back down the highway. One thing you guys need to understand was how dark it was. With it being later than midnight and not a single light on, the only thing illuminating my way were my subpar headlight. On top of that, it was snowing quite heavily. If my car were to die or my headlights were to go out, I'd be completely fucked. Lucky for me, neither of those things happened, but something worse did. About 10 kilometers down, what I can only assume was a dirt road underneath the mountains of snow in the middle of nowhere. I came across a car in the middle of the road with its hazards on. The car was diagonal across the road and from its tracks I could tell it tried to stop suddenly and lost control. Throwing my hazards on and getting out, I attempted to survey the scene. Moving about 20 meters from the car, I could not see any signs of life and noticed that the driver's side door was swung open and snow was piling inside the car. What alarmed me the most was what looked like blood on the inside of the window and all over the steering wheel. Upon clearing the snow from inside the car, it was obvious that there was a pretty brutal accident here as there was blood all over the driver's side. My mediocre first aid train kicked in. My first response was to call 911 and get an ambulance out here. Pulling out my cell phone, the most cliche thing happened to me. There was no fucking cell service. Obviously there's no fucking cell service, I screamed. I'm out in the fucking boonies. After having my little meltdown, I decided to go see if there were any tracks or something to lead me to this obviously injured person. At this point, I had completely forgotten about the delivery and was pretty intent on helping whoever fucked up out here in the boonies. The chance of another car coming by all the way out here this late was slim to fucking none. So this was on me. Using my delivery driver skills, I managed to deduce a few things. This person obviously hit something really, really, really big 
Like a moose or a large bear, the front of his car was almost entirely caved in and both his wheels were going opposite directions. No way this thing was going anywhere. Drawing on past experience, I actually couldn't think of anything that would do so much damage to a car like that. Seeing a small trail of blood leading up the road, I assumed he probably went walking to look for help. This was where I made my first mistake. I followed the trail of blood on foot, wanting to play the hero. I bundled up and set out in the storm with the small LED flashlight that made decent light. At this point, I wasn't even thinking about my safety. I was concerned with whoever had injured themselves in that accident and getting them to safety. After about five minutes of walking, I realized that I had fucked up majorly as a singular thought came through my mind. What if whatever this driver hit was still out there? Judging by how big the impact on the car was, I can only guess that it was a grizzly bear or something unknown much larger. Dealing with a wounded animal in the middle of winter was not something my pay grade covered. After my moment of clarity, I decided my best bet was to get back to my car and get back to cell service and call 911. Not even after I had taken 10 steps back towards my car, I heard what sounded like an entire tree being torn from the ground. The noise was absolutely deafening and threw me into a wild fucking panic. I started sprinting back to my car, but kept getting slowed down by the fact that my legs could not coordinate with each other. After sprinting about five steps, I ate shit hard. I tripped face first into a snowbank and just laid there, trying to recollect myself and take a bearing. Just as I was about to get up again, I heard it. I heard what sounded like heavy breathing coming from just out of visual range. To top it off, the noise was coming from towards the accident scene and my car. At this point, something felt terribly wrong. That labored breathing sounded more animal than human and was far too loud for any human to make. Being scared shitless, I literally could not move out of that snowbank. After what seemed like an eternity, the breathing got louder and louder until suddenly I saw whatever was making that terrible noise. Whatever that thing was, it had to be standing minimum eight feet tall. Yes, you are reading that correctly. It was fucking standing. It was running on two feet, but every couple of steps, it would stumble and start running like a bear on four legs. It had sort of a lopping motion to it, that reminded me almost exactly of a bear, but then it would get on two feet and start running like a human. It was also entirely covered in thick white fur and would have been almost impossible to spot had it not been covered in blood. Whether or not that was its blood or the driver of that car, I never stuck around to find out. Whatever that thing was, was too distracted to see me and sprinted right past me down the middle of the road, still breathing as heavy as ever. After what I thought was a solid 10 minutes, I forced myself out of the snowbank and sprinted back to my car. When I got back to my car, all four of my doors were wide open and the pizza boxes were strewn all over the road. Not even thinking about the pizza or the delivery, I drove straight to the police station to report whatever had happened. Officially, the police report states that the driver of that car collided with a large bear and that the bear dragged him off into the woods and devoured him. They never found his body, but did find what happened to be a portion of his spine almost 80 kilometers from where the accident site was. It was a really big thing in our town. People spent weeks searching for him. Apparently, he was the distant second cousin of the elderly lady I was supposed to deliver to. That part didn't surprise me. Most of the redneck folk out that way 
are partially related to each other. What really fucked me up about all this is that the police and conservation officers killed almost every bear in a 50 kilometer radius and examined the contents of their stomach. None of the bears killed had any human flesh in their guts and the reports state that the only thing big enough to cause an accident of that caliber is a large bear. Whatever that thing was that the driver hit, it's still out there, and I hopefully will never see it again. I used to work as a pizza delivery guy in Detroit for several years. I'm not going to tell you what part of the city I used to live in, or the name of the pizza chain that employed me. It's not important, and besides, it has absolutely no bearing on the story I'm about to tell. The neighborhoods I used to work in were fairly safe, but sometimes I was sent to areas that had been truly devastated by the recession. If you've ever visited Detroit or done a Google image search on urban blight, you know what I'm talking about. The incident occurred late in the fall a few years ago, and the memory of it will stay with me until the day I die. It doesn't matter how hard I try to suppress it or force it out of my mind. It always floats back up to the surface like a dead bloated fish and lets me know that it's still there. Anyways, here's what happened. It was a Thursday evening. It had been a hectic shift and I was making the last delivery for the night. The order was going to a residence in one of the less savory parts of town. That didn't really shock me. It was to be expected every now and again. Even folks in rough areas order pizzas and have cell phones. After all, this is the US we're talking about. But I have to admit, I wasn't too thrilled about the possibility of getting mugged or shot. Any half decent car in a poor section of town is fair game for the local gangbangers. And believe me, there are plenty of those in Detroit. The house was just a tiny little fibro shack on a big corner block. There were no lights on inside, and for a brief moment I prayed that I had the wrong address. But a quick look at the mailbox out front squashed my hopes of a safe getaway. I cursed silently as I gazed out over the desolate property. The moon was out and that made it even creepier. I could see the grass on the lawn was knee high and there was rubbish everywhere. The fibro sheets were riddled with holes and the windows were boarded up with plywood and adorned with graffiti and bullet holes. Needless to say, I had a very bad feeling about what was about to happen and if it had been up to me, I would have just kept on driving. But that was out of the question. I couldn't afford to lose my job, and career opportunities weren't exactly growing on the trees in this city. So I stayed where I was. I took a few deep breaths to try to calm myself and said a quick prayer, even though I don't believe in God. Then I grabbed the pizza boxes and reached for the Coke Zero bottle next to me in the passenger seat. Then I found myself walking up to the house. The cold evening air gushing through the area was racing in and out of my lungs like pistons in a car engine. The gravel made loud crunching noises every time I put my feet down, and I kept looking around nervously, convinced that some psycho was going to jump me any second, but no one came. I was all alone. As I climbed up the concrete stoop leading up to the porch, I noticed the front door was ajar, and I stopped dead in my tracks and just stared at it. For some strange reason, it scared the crap out of me, and I could feel my heart start to race along even faster. A voice inside my head kept telling me to get the fuck out of there, and I have to admit, I seriously entertained the idea of just leaving the pizzas on the porch and taking off, but I knew I couldn't. I had to follow protocol. Leaving food outside of a residence was a sackable offense. So I walked the rest of the way to the door and gave it a quick knock. 
The force of my fist striking the old timber made it move, and a loud guttural sound escaped from somewhere deep inside me as the squeaky hinges gave off a high-pitched wail. But no one came to the door. I swallowed hard, braced myself, and put my knuckles up to the door again. At this time, I shouted the words, Pizza is here, into the dark void. But still, there was no answer, and I foolishly believed I was off the hook. Then, as I was about to turn around and leave, a faint, cold, raspy voice coming from somewhere deep inside the house told me to enter. I stood absolutely still, staring at the gap in the door with eyes that were ready to pop out of their sockets. And for a brief second, I started wondering if I just imagined it. But then the voice called out again, and this time it kept repeating the words over and over like it was reciting an incantation. It had a menacing quality to it, and my whole body started shaking, and that's when I made up my mind. I threw the pizzas down, not really giving a fuck about whether I had a job to go to the next day or not. Then I legged it. I jumped from the top of the stoop and ran like a lunatic down the driveway back to my car and almost ripped the door off its hinges as I threw myself inside. My hands were shaking so badly that it took me a good 10 seconds just to get the engine started. Then I raced out of the neighborhood as fast as I could, gasping for air all the way back to the restaurant. Maybe it was the effect of the adrenaline wearing off, or maybe it was just a delayed reaction. But when I opened the door and got out of the car, I threw up. A whole gutful of yellow disgusting puke. But at least I was alive, and that was all that mattered. The next morning, I woke up to someone banging on my door. When I opened up, two police officers greeted me with stony expressions. After asking me a few questions, one of them took a step forward, looked me straight in the eyes, and informed me that two pizza delivery guys had been found dead inside the house that I had ran away from the previous evening. Both of them had been hung by the neck. He then pulled out a picture from the inside of his jacket and handed it to me. He gave me a few seconds to study it, and then he told me that they had found that picture taped to one of the bodies. It contained three faces. Two had a big red X drawn across them. The last one didn't. The last face was mine. I managed to look up at the officer and shake my head before I passed out and hit the floor. The next day, I left Detroit, and I've never been back since. But even now, after all this time, I always look over my shoulder when I'm out and about. I'm almost always staying indoors after dark now, and I always make sure my doors and windows are locked. The killer in Detroit was never caught, and as long as he's out there, I'm on my guard. And why shouldn't I be? He obviously knows who I am, but does he know where I live? This is a story about the most disturbing thing that ever happened to me while delivering pizzas in high school. There are a few others, but this one stands above the rest. I was 16 years old and just got my license, so I needed a job to pay for a car. A few of my good friends were working at a local pizza place in town, close to my house. So I decided to apply, and I got the job without having to interview because they were so short-staffed. They also hired me as a delivery driver without ever checking to see if I had a driver's license or not. I did, but I always thought that was funny. About a month or two later, we were having a really busy night, and I was sent off to a delivery in a fairly nice part of town the next city over. This was before GPS was common and not very reliable, so we still used maps to locate houses. 
this particular house was in a new development, so it wasn't listed in any of our directories. But my boss thought he knew where it was and gave me directions. He was way off, so I had to call the house for directions. And this is where things got weird. The conversation on the phone was normal. I told the man I was near his house, but needed directions because the ones I was given weren't accurate. He was very understanding and told me how to get there from the road I was on. A few minutes later, I pull into his driveway and instantly got a bad feeling. He was a man in his early 50s or 60s and was standing in the middle of his driveway with a creepy, satisfied smile on his face and wearing a maroon silk bathrobe. I got out of my car and gave him his 10-inch Hawaiian pizza, which costed $10.95 at the time. He gave me a $20 bill and told me to keep the change. Considering I was late on the delivery and had to call the customer for directions, I wasn't expecting anything for a tip, let alone almost 10 bucks. I drove away from the delivery thinking that something was off, but I got a great tip, so I was happy. I lit up a smoke and turned up my radio when I felt my phone vibrate. It was the number from the house I was just at. I got nervous thinking it was going to be a complaint or something because why else would someone call the delivery guy after he has delivered your food? My blood curdled at the words that came out of his mouth. Do you want to come back over and get the knife? Or at least that is what I heard. I said nothing and hung up the phone and drove back to work as fast as I could. I also called one of my friends who was working there at the time and told him what happened. On the five minute ride back to work, he called me at least three or four more times. For some reason, I actually answered one of the calls and he asked me if I wanted to come back after I get off work and spend the night. I was greeted at work by laughter from pretty much everyone working that night. Everyone thought I was either faking or overreacting. Then I got another call on my phone from the same guy. I showed my manager while the phone was ringing and let it go to voicemail. That's when he decided to call the restaurant. Once this happened, my manager realized this was probably a serious situation and answered the phone pretending to be me. He had a very short conversation with the guy and at the end told him he is not allowed to do business with us anymore and we are blocking his number. When my boss hung up the phone, his face was pure white and looked like he could barely comprehend what had just happened. I asked what the guy said, but my boss would not repeat the words that came out of his mouth. I was so paranoid that I had to stay with a friend that night instead of going home. Guess who called me a couple hours later? Yeah, he called at least 10 times. For at least a week or two, I was living in fear of being kidnapped. I was always looking at the people or cars that were around me, being paranoid that I was being watched or followed. It's possible that I was right because I started getting phone calls again. This is when I decided it was time to call the cops and put an end to this. I explained everything to the officer and he assured me that he would take care of the situation. Turns out the cop did nothing. I live in a low crime town of less than 20,000 people. This guy didn't have anything else to do that day except write some speeding tickets during the afternoon, then some DWIs in the evening. The calls kept coming and my paranoia grew. This needed to stop, so I told my boss that things hadn't improved and he called the cops himself. An officer came down to the restaurant and took down our statements. Unlike the other officer, this man seemed visibly shaken and angered by the events that had happened. He promised me that he would personally handle the situation and I didn't have to worry anymore. The police officer followed up on what he said and I never heard from that creep again. I kept the same job for about three years and had nothing but great times there. However, creepy silk bathrobe guy, let's not meet again.
So, I, being a student, delivers pizzas to pay for school. Saturday night, we get a call around 1 a.m. to a motel I hadn't delivered to in a while that's kind of out of the way. There aren't many other buildings around it, and it's on the edge of our map of the area we deliver to. I drove the 20 minutes and pulled into the parking lot and noticed there weren't very many cars, maybe two or three for a motel with almost 200 rooms. It was kind of strange, but it was Saturday, so I figured most people were out or they weren't doing much business this weekend. I drove around the building for a while looking for the right room number or at least something close to it and I noticed a van behind me. It was one of those big work vans with the sliding doors except pretty beat up and it had this creepy deer skull chained to the front like a hood ornament. I figured they were doing the same thing as me looking for the right room. I was getting a little confused because I had forgotten that odd numbered rooms are on one end of the motel and even numbers are on the other so I had been driving around for a while. I started noticing that none of the room's lights were on and the light was off in the office as well but this van was still behind me. That's when I started getting a bit creeped out but chalked it up to paranoia. Being a delivery driver can be like that sometimes, but being a girl driver makes you even more paranoid. This is usually the point where I would have walked in the office and asked the attendant to call the room and have them come to the office to get it for safety reasons. I took the turn to the office and the van stopped following me. I parked and got out when I saw a sign on the office door that says, out of business management. Fuck. I should have turned around and went back to the store right then, but I had come all the way out and just wanted to get it over with. I found the room and knocked on the door, and this older man opens it. He looked like a cowboy, tucked in plaid shirt, boots, and a bolo tie, except his eyes were horribly bloodshot, and his hands were shaking pretty badly as I handed him the pizza. He thanked me and even gave me a pretty good tip and I wished him a good night and headed back to the car. This is when I noticed the van had parked right behind my car, blocking it in. It started to pull into a parking spot and I was relieved, but it had just turned around, blocking my car in with the sliding door of the van facing me this time. I stopped, scared to death, and for the first time, I noticed through the windows that there were more than five men in this van. I ran around to the side of the building, trying to go around them in order to get back into my car. I figured if I could just get inside and lock the doors, everything would be alright. I heard the van door slide open and footsteps. I ran faster and cut through an alley and I had heard running behind me. I got into my car, locked the doors. A man with a long beard and dirty ripped clothing runs up and starts banging on my window. He yells, hey, we want to play with you. Stop being such a bitch and get in the car. I throw the car in reverse. I hit the van and push it just enough to give me room to cut the wheel and get away. I looked back and saw them all getting out of the van and piling into the room of the guy I had delivered to. I felt stupid for not realizing sooner that he, I'm assuming, set the whole thing up. I made sure to blacklist that motel when I got back and I'm taking a week off.